Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and guests and all of you on Zoom. It's wonderful to see everybody. Thank you very much to our greeters this afternoon, Quinn Dolan and Priscilla Trevino. We're yes, indeed. We're going to get started with the musical introduction by David Rogers. David. Thank you, President Jennifer, fellow Rotarians. We've heard expressions of school spirit from our Gonzaga and Wazoo alums in the last month, and a little bit of noise from the occasional Husky heckler. <clears throat> I thought this week it would be appropriate to share a little school spirit from our neighbors in Ellensburg and Rotary sponsors, Central Washington University, and rather than torture you all with a performance of my own on an instrument that hasn't come out of the closet in months or years, I thought I would call our principal hornist for the Akima Symphony Orchestra, Dr. Jeff Snedeker, who also happens to be the horn professor at Central, and he has helped line up some authentic wildcat spirit to perform the uh, alma mater and fight song of Central Washington University. Please welcome the CWU Horn Quartet. Thank you so very much. That's wonderful performance. Next with our invocation, David Links. Good afternoon. So today's program is about leadership. So I look to Deepak Chopra's book called The Soul of Leadership. He said a true leader is the soul of a collective consciousness. The collective consciousness could be a small unit like a family or a business it could be a community, a country, or the world, but the principle is the same. As human beings, we are very different from other species. We have longings, we have aspirations, we have dreams, we have desires, we learn from experience. We look at context, relationships, meanings, and we are storytellers. No other species tells itself stories, at least we don't know. About the past, about our lives in the moment, stories about the future. When you look at these stories, in a sense, they are all love stories but it has some great elements. It tells you where we are. It tells you where we could be. It has trials and tribulations. It has a quest and the teaching of the, and the reaching of the mountaintop. It doesn't matter if it's a story of a family, community, or the world. A good story is the story of the hero's quest. 
a good story starts with a dream. A leader's story is not about an individual dream, but a collective dream. When Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, he was referring not to himself, but to the collective vision. Stories have change and transformation. That is what the soul of leadership is about, transformation. It's not about managers or management, but leadership. A good leader is an agent for change and transformation. The leader is the soul of the collective consciousness. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. One of the uh, saddest duties that I have as president is to share with you when a member has passed away, and that is the case today. A Rotarian Terry Ellis passed away on May 27th with her husband Jim and daughters by her side. She was a member of this club since 2015. A celebration of life is planned for her on Sunday, June 6th at 1 p.m. at Brookside Funeral Home. If you would please stand and join me in a moment of silence as we honor Terry Ellis. Thank you. Now with some happier news, despite the pandemic, we had four of our new members recently achieve all of the goals of Rotary Education to turn their red badge into a blue badge. And I get to present those blue badges to you today. First, Laura Crooks. Absolutely. Next, Kyle Curtis. Come on down, Kyle. <laughs> Next, Jane Davis. And Jeff Scott. Jeff. All right, and again, despite a pandemic, we are joined with a new member introduction today, Sarah Morgan. Sarah, come on up. Good afternoon. This is an introduction that has been a long time coming as the pandemic, a man with a very busy life, and no in-person meetings have delayed his official welcome as a new member to our club. Charles H. Royer, now residing in Prosser, is entering our ranks with a very broad and diverse background and a new dedication to our valley. Chuck was raised in Portland, Oregon. He attended Central Catholic High School. Uh, Chuck attended the University of Portland, achieving his BS in political science. The, he then attended UC Riverside for his graduate studies in political science. He met his wife, Renee, while in college, and they have recently celebrated their 54th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> Chuck served our country as a captain in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1965 to 1970, stationed in Quantico, Virginia, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, Camp Pendleton, and in Vietnam. His primary MOS was combat engineer. In Vietnam, he was a BN staff officer and company commander for the duration of his duty. Thank you for your service, Chuck. Chuck had had an amazing opportunity after returning from duty. Continental in Illinois Bank, the seventh largest bank in the country at the time, hired Chuck for a unique program that trained those who had served as officers in combat selected for their leadership skills as opposed to education, a departure from decades old tradition of recruiting solely from top tier Ivy League schools and MBA graduates. After training, Chuck worked in corporate cash management. Chuck then went on to start a career in life and health insurance initially with Lincoln National Life Insurance Company and eventually became an independent agent. By 2000, Chuck found his calling as a partner and co-founder in investment and wealth management with Harvest Capital Advisors in Bellevue, Washington with 250 million under management. This was when he thought he might retire. Nope. 
Uh, in 2017, Chuck became principal and founder of an advisory and consulting business helping large orthopedic surgery practices for 16 partners. Services included corporate and financial management consulting. He assisted large practices uh, dealing with rapid growth, partner level communications, business infrastructure, cash flow, and business planning. Fast forward to his second retirement. Nope, <laughs> again. Zilla called. Chuck and his family found themselves drawn through music and a sense of wanting a, in a community in which they could belong to settle in Prosser and purchase the old warehouse. If you've not been there since the Royer family took over, the furniture auction has done an incredible business during lockdown. There's still great furniture down there. Uh, the Chop House restaurant has been completely remodeled and they have new management and, and chef. And the music venue will once again be hosting world renowned music artists from all over. This is Chuck's new passion as it combines all of his skills learned in multiple disciplines, as well as close family connections and partnerships to bring great food and music to our Valley. As a partner and leader with his family, the Royers have added so much to our Valley so far, and Chuck will only bring more service and depth to our Rotary Club. I introduce to you, Chuck Royer. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Sarah. I didn't recognize any of that. <clears throat> but I appreciate uh, being able to join Rotary. And I look forward to uh, helping you in whatever the calling becomes. So thank you. And I won't take much more of your time. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Check before you run off. Before you run off, Chuck, we have some, uh, some gifts to give you today. Wow. First, the rotary plaque that I hope you proudly display on your wall. Thank you. Your rotary pin. Your red badge that turns to blue when you re uh, reach for your rotary education. A okay. uh, little wallet card. The blue book. And you all remember this, don't you? License plate frame. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, Sunny Cameron with an update on our Rotary Playground at the Greenway. Sunny. Oh, this is nice to see everybody. This is fantastic. Um, I know that everyone's heard an awful lot about the Rotary Playground, um, but it's coming really, really close. And this is um, a volunteer opportunity like we've really never seen. Um, this is one of the largest volunteer projects in Yakima's history. Um, we've got the three Rotary Clubs and the Rotary Trust all participating. Um, and we are being led by Kelly Conton at the Greenway. Um, the existing playground, as you might know, has already been removed. And we've got the site ready to um, prepare for the brand new, very large, very um, whimsical and very creative playground that will go in. Um, I hope that you've all seen the volunteer opportunities to sign up through uh, Sign Up Genius. Uh, what is it called? Uh, anyway, uh, there, there have been lots of emails and we are really low actually on, on, um, on volunteers. Leathers is the company that is leading us and they're the ones who are gonna project manage for us as the outside organization. And they recommend that we have 100 volunteers a day and it's a six day build. And um, if you have an opportunity to participate between June 22nd and June 26th, um, we need your help. Uh, we've got some captains that will be taking on um, some leadership responsibilities. And there are a lot of, lot of things to do. A lot of different volunteer opportunities. You don't have to come with your tool belt. You can come just about any way that you'd like, and we can put you into the right category. So if you could please consider signing up on um, uh, signupgenius.com. All the information is on the Rotary website. 
um, we would sure appreciate it. And one last shout out to our community service committee. Um, Dave Brown just sent out an invite this morning, and we hope that you will all that are on the committee join us for a Zoom meeting June 9th, which is next Wednesday at 1 p.m. And uh, we can get our we can get our committee rounded up and and activated. It's going to be an amazing project. If you haven't seen the renderings, I recommend that you take a look. That is exactly that. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, any anybody's welcome. We are, however, limiting the age group. So, um, Dave, it's remind me that the age group is te ten and up, um, and it's going to be a great it's going to be a great opportunity. It's a pretty large site. We've got the um, we've got the transportation worked out and a lot of logistics. The committee's been working really hard at this. Um, so anyway, I hope that you'd consider it, even if you just came out for, for half a shift or something, it would be awfully nice to consider it because it's going to be a, a pretty incredible project. So we hope to see you there and we hope to see you sign up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now our Sergeant at Arms, at arms, arms Sergeant at Arms, I should say, Mike Hummel. Thank you, Jennifer. So good to see everybody. It's awesome to be doing this in person. I think my last three of these have been on Zoom. So I'm an in-person kind of guy. It's nice to be back. Hey, and that's even working too. Right on. Uh, I'm going to do my Sergeant in Arms on Memorial Day. We just celebrated Memorial Day a couple of days ago. And I figured I'd, I'd kind of pay homage to that with a, a, a little question and answer. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a question and give you four options. And if you get the right one, great. And if not, please pay a dollar to Rotary Charities. Uh, Dwayne, go ahead. All right, my first question for you guys. Memorial Day was originally known as what? Is it A, Memorial Day, B, Decoration Day, C, Fallen Soldier Day, or D, National Hero Day? It's B, Decoration Day. Originally known as Decoration Day, Memorial Day is an American holiday that honors the men and women who have died while serving in the U.S. military. If you didn't know, pay a dollar, please. Next slide, please. The origins of Memorial Day began with soldiers gathering to honor the fallen after which war? Is it A, the Civil War, B, World War I, C, the Korean War, or D, World War II? Best guesses? Answer is A, the Civil War. The celebration of Decoration Day began on May 30th, 1868 to honor those who lost their lives during the Civil War. The date was chosen because it was not the anniversary of any particular battle from the war. Next slide, please. Memorial Day is celebrated on which day? Is it the last day in May? Uh, is it May 30th? C, the last Monday in May, or D, the last Sunday in May? Any guesses? It is C, the last Monday in May. Here's your reason why. For decades, Memorial Day was observed on May the 30th until Congress passed the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which established Memorial Day as the last Monday in May for the specific reason of creating a three-day holiday for federal employees. Because <laughs> that's what's most important in this. Next slide is up. Memorial Day became a federal holiday in what year? Is it A, 1918, B, 1865, C, 1971, or D, 1945? Any guesses? It's C, 1971. The Uniform Monday Holiday Act was passed by Congress in 1968, and the official change to the last day in May and the recognition as a federal holiday took place in 1971. Next slide, please. Each year, a national moment of remembrance occurs at what time on Memorial Day? Is it A, 12 midnight? Is it B, 3 p.m. local time? Is it C, 12 noon? Or is it D, when the dawn breaks? Any guesses? It's B, 3 p.m. local time. Americans are encouraged to share in a moment of silence at 3 p.m. at their local time on Memorial Day. This time has been chosen because it is a time of day in which most Americans are likely making the most of the freedoms we enjoy. I gotta say that's probably pretty accurate for most of us. 
What city is recognized as the birthplace of Memorial Day? Is it A, Washington, D.C., B, Charleston, South Carolina, C, Alexandria, Virginia, or D, Waterloo, New York? Any guesses? It's D, Waterloo, New York. I've got a little bit of a note for you on this one. I thought this was kind of interesting. It is unclear where exactly the tradition originated. Numerous different communities may have independently initiated the memorial gatherings. Some records show that one of the early, earliest Memorial Day commemorations was organized by a group of formerly enslaved people in Charleston, South Carolina, less than a month after the Confederacy surrendered in 1865. Nevertheless, in 1966, the federal government declared Waterloo, New York, the official birthplace of Memorial Day. Waterloo, which first began celebrating the day on May 5th, 1866, was chosen because it hosted an annual community-wide event during which all businesses closed and residents decorated the graves of the fallen soldiers with flowers and flags. A tradition that stands till today. And my last one for you, what type of flower is often worn on Memorial Day? Is it A, a red poppy flower, B, a purple lilac, C, a white rose, or D, a pink carnation? It is A, it is a red poppy flower. World War I Lieutenant Colonel John McRae penned a poem titled In Flanders Field. The poem was written in response to McRae's wartime experiences, and he referenced the red poppy flowers sprouting from the war-torn fields in France and Belgium, and it has stuck, and folks will still don a red poppy flower today uh, in honor of Memorial Day. That is all that I've got. Thank you to everyone who has served, our newest member, Chuck. Much appreciated. And to all of those uh, other Rotarians who have served. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much, Mike. Now with our speaker program introduction, Aaron Black joining us on Zoom. Aaron. Hi, good afternoon, amazing Rotarians. And I have to say this is such a weird place to be. I'm, I'm here on video and, and a lot of you are there in person. And I'm really hoping I'm not a big head on the screen, but I might be. Um, I am just so excited and privileged to be able to introduce two speakers today, two very amazing speakers. And I'm, I'm gonna introduce them alphabetically. Um, first is Dr. Jim Godino. Um, just want to share a little bit about him. And, and one thing is that it has been great in my six years serving on the Central Washington University Board of Trustees to work with such a strong leader. And um, as we all know, he is just days from retirement. So uh, Dr. Godino, I can't promise that that won't come up in questions from myself or the audience. <laughs> but uh, since becoming president of Central Washington University in 2009, President James Godino has taken to heart the institution's primary mission of being a welcoming institution that prepares its students for enlightened, responsible, and productive lives. Under his leadership, Central has experienced a record infusion of state construction funding, completed a comprehensive overhaul and updated, updating of information systems, initiated a modernization of budget and management systems, and sought to create a safe and inclusive campus environment. President Gaudino came to CWU from Kent State University, where he founded the College of Communication and Information and guided its development into a center of innovation in the study of the new information age. Prior to that, President Gaudino was the executive director of the National Communication Association and served on the faculty of Michigan State University's Department of Advertising. He has a PhD in communications from Michigan State University and holds a Master of Science degree in management from Troy State University. He is, a, he is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and served in the US Air Force in California, Turkey, and Germany. Thank you for your service. And President Gaudino announced earlier this year that he will step down from his post on June 6th. So right around the corner and we caught him right in time. Um, and, and uh, I can tell you that if you've not been to the central campus, you need to go there. Uh, it has changed drastically and some amazing improvements um, that I mentioned in, the, um, in his introduction. I'm also very privileged 
and honored to be able to share information about Dr. Mark Larson. And uh, we'll hear more about the collaboration between um, Kittitas County and the university. And Dr. Mark Larson has been a family medicine doctor and health officer in Kittitas County for many years. He graduated and completed his medical residency at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. And prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, worked as a physician for Kittitas Valley Healthcare. He has held the position of Kittitas County Health Officer since 2006, which has now become a full-time position in response to the pandemic. As a health officer, Dr. Larson is mandated by law to take any action necessary to maintain health and sanitation in the county. Health officers must be licensed physicians and appointed by the local board of health. When public health regulation is not enough to protect public health, the health officer can issue a health order legally compelling individuals or parties to put an immediate end to public health hazards and emergencies. In 2015, Dr. Larson received multiple awards, including the Dr. John Anderson Memorial Award for Outstanding Rural Health Practitioner. And most recently, Dr. Larson was named Person of the Year in 2020 via the Ellensburg Daily Record. And Dr. Larson enjoys spending time with his family and is an avid outdoorsman. So perfect area in central Washington to be an outdoors individual. So how we're gonna do this today is, is I'm not sure why they chose me, but now I get to facilitate questions. So you are under my leadership right now, Dr. Godino and Larson. So um, I am going to start, there's, there's really three phases I wanna do this in. We're going to talk about, we've talked a lot about COVID-19. Our world has been just inundated. And we think about before COVID-19, and it almost seems like there was never a, a pre-COVID-19. But we're seeing signs of hope that there will be a post-COVID-19. And one of the things that is so interesting is being able to reflect as a community about how we've come together, um, all communities, to really deal with the pandemic. And from my position uh, at the Memorial Foundation, we saw the strength of communities coming together to donate PPE, to really um, pull together to support first responders and healthcare workers. And so this is gonna be a, a very amazing story about leadership. And so I wanna talk, ask some questions around about the beginning of COVID-19 in Kittitas County. What are the next steps that both of you see? And then beyond COVID-19, um, what, what do we see for the future? So I'm going to um, start with talking about collaboration and partnership, because that's one thing as a board of trustee that I've heard very extensively about is the strong partnership um, that Kittitas County has had with Central Washington University. So can you both and maybe we'll we'll start with Jim and then go to Mark, you know, um, it's hard on on Zoom. But how important is it in a small community like Ellensburg to establish close relationships between different public agencies like the city and the university? Well, it's essential, Erin. And thank you for, for having uh, Mark and I. And I would just add that this is, this is not the only time that I have served under your leadership. You've been my boss for six years. So, so thank <laughs> you for being such a great one. Um, uh, it's absolutely essential. You know, one of the things that we'll probably say more than once is in a, in a, is in a community like as small as Ellensburg, uh, when Central is in full bloom, you know, when all the students are there and where our classes are going, we represent about 50% of the total pop uh, population of Ellensburg. And if you, if you then extend that to the county, we're about 20 to 25% of the county's population. So when something like COVID hits, we we feel this immediate sense of social responsibility because we are, if you will, if you will, we're half of the problem. Uh, and, and probably given the, the nature of students, um, the, well, they, they, they tend to like to socialize, let's put it that way, right? And we know that that's not, that's not good during a pandemic. So we're probably more than half of the problem, truth be told. And we come from all over the state, all over the region, and to a lesser extent, all over the world. So we're bringing, we're really bringing disease in this case to a, a small uh, a small community. And we are completely without uh, epidemiological expertise. I mean, we, we have a few faculty members that teach it in that area, but we don't, we don't have the full range of medical expertise that, uh, that Dr. Larson has, and we certainly don't have the authorities that, that he has. So the partnership is, 
Well, it's not important. It's it's absolutely uh, essential. And I'll, I'll turn over to Mark to see if he uh, if he has anything to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Jim. And I certainly am going to miss our collaboration. So congratulations on your retirement. I'm sure you, you and I will be in touch. But uh, I agree with, with President Godino. It has been the collaborative work that's been done between public health and Central Washington University is the reason that we've been successful in Kittitas County. And it's not that we have not had a lot of difficult conversations and a lot of difficult decisions that have had to be made. But from the beginning of, even before the beginning of, of COVID, uh, we had kind of a taste of this last year, two years ago, when we had a student come back from Panama that was exposed to the measles and was an unvaccinated student. So we kind of had a touch of that. We had a touch of, of perhaps a early scare of a student who came back from China in February and, uh, and our collaborative work has, has continued since that, since that time. And I think without that, especially since what President Godino was saying about the percentage of students that make up the Ellensburg community or basically the students and the faculty and staff um, Ellensburg is central and central is Ellensburg. So, uh, so we had to work together. It certainly has been helpful uh, having been in Ellensburg for 23 years and, and being a local health officer has helped to um, bridge that collaboration between central and public health. Thank you. Um, so when you're thinking back, uh, back, which seems a long time ago when we start, first started hearing the news and we started to see, you know, Seattle was one of the initial uh, uh, locations in um, the United States to, to see COVID start to um, peak. What were, what were some of your initial thoughts as, as that started to come to fruition? Because I know for me, it was, you know, when you hear about something like this from far away in a different country, it doesn't seem as close as, as Seattle. It isn't as close as Seattle, but I'm curious to know um, what was important during the early stages and then talk a little bit about some of the initial challenges. And so this time I'm gonna start with Dr. Larson from, a, from a, a health officer standpoint, as this news started to come out, what, what were some of the initial challenges you were dealing with? And, and then when did that conversation with the university come into play? And then vice versa, Dr. Godino, when that gets to you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so I was hired in 2006 as a, a backup health officer because we had a health officer that lived in Seattle and we were looking at the possibility of a pandemic at that time, if you remember back to 2006. And there was concern about whether or not she would be able to get over to Ellensburg. She subsequently resigned her position and I became full time or became point two. In November and December of 2019, it became obvious that there was a problem in China. And I think we in public health were primed to see that there was, um, that we had a big problem going on despite difficulty with information. Uh, I have a whiteboard on behind me here. Tristan Lamb and I started to uh, develop what we, what we thought was gonna happen going forward, um, which turned out if, as we were looking at it, uh, it, really, it really outlined what, what happened with, with COVID in early um, 2020. And, um, and we realized that, that Central was a big part of what we were gonna see here. Central has not just a Washington approach, but we have a lot of exchange students from different parts of the world that, that study at Central Washington University. It's a very welcoming community and has become much more broad in its approach to education of different populations, and we knew that was an that we knew that was an issue. We had a student who came back from China in February, like I had mentioned, and that and we ended up hospitalizing that student. Um, 
and while we were waiting on for 14 days to get a COVID test back, if you remember how long it took at the beginning to get COVID testing back from the CDC, that student turned out to be negative, but we knew that it was a problem. And Jim and I started talking at that point uh, on a regular basis. And then when we had the outbreak really starting in full, uh, first in Everett and then in the um, Seattle area, starting with uh, nursing home outbreak. Uh, that became spring break time and all the students uh, left, which is common in like this in the summer. It's very quiet in Ellensburg in the summer because our students our students go home and 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 President Godino and I had a very difficult conversation about all of our students left town going to a place where there's a pandemic starting to spread. And we are, I think our first a very initial difficult conversation was about writing a health order that Central Washington University could not bring their students back after spring break. Um, that could have been a very difficult start of a, a very difficult relationship. And I think what it did really was allowed us to work collaboratively we both agreed that that was the approach uh, and started working, um, trying to come up with solutions that would work both for Central, uh, the students at Central, the safety of the community. Um, and it's been, and it's continued uh, going forward. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Mark. Um, I, I, I will admit to having I don't recall ever having been in the public health offices in, in my first 10 years at Central Washington. We had conversations, but they were always at a rotary meeting or some other, other place. And I knew uh, uh, you know, who Dr. Larson was, but I would you know, not call him a colleague in those days because we had, he wasn't my primary, uh, my primary family physician. I had had a different one. And um, uh, so we, we had to get to know each other. And I think, uh, I think what, what united us was our, I mean, we had the same goals, but I think we also understood that we were both in, in difficult positions. Um, uh, closing a university, I mean, it was obvious uh, to myself and to, and to Dr. Larson that we had to close the university down uh, it, it, from, from a face-to-face -face standpoint. We had to send our faculty and staff home. We had to, we had to and what that meant was, you know, we're a face-to-face University, we 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 small sections, teaching faculty, very very close relationships between faculty and students, with without a significant online presence, and we had to pivot to an to uh, initially an entirely online university in in three weeks, and so uh, that's that's a her Herculean effort for any organization, but for for the academy, which you know we we. We think geological time. We think icebergs move fast. You know, we're just not those. We're just not that pivot on a dime uh, kind of community. So, so um, I think without. I think it was unspoken, but I think um, Dr. Larson and I uh, agreed to use each other, and then to and then to protect each other. It's it's not unlike the the soldiers. You know, facing the the two soldiers. The 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 last two soldiers facing a charge will sometimes go back to back so that they've got each other's back protected. And I think that was kind of an unspoken reality that uh, I could blame Mark for closing the university. I mean, not literally blame him, but you know, he signed the order. I didn't have the authority to do that. He does have the authority to create a public health order that says, you, you know, the students are not, you don't come back and you should work from home. And he did it uh, really before Governor Inslee started doing it on a, on a, on a broader uh, basis. And then I could focus on, uh, uh, on, on, on pivoting the university to online and, and not have to debate that decision on campus. In the same respects, that, that meant a lot of restaurants, uh, social establishments, retail operations that, that lived off of our students, uh, we're, go we're going after after Dr. Larson. I mean, it's a political question. It's an economic issue, a political issue, uh, and 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 certainly a health issue. So we we found ways, I think, to support one another. And you know, I found as much way as I could to 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 keep to keep those students we did have. We found places that are uh, that that were safe for our students to study, and 
and Dr. Larson would then create exceptions to his, his more sweeping order. That was the first one, and that allowed some economic activity to continue. So I think that partnership in solving the solving a mutual problem, but with the same goals of, of providing a, a, a health and a healthful safety uh, oriented community, and it continues to work today. We're still we're still taking that uh, that basic approach. Thank you. And now looking back a, a little over a year uh, or a year and a half, what at the start of the pandemic, are there things that, that either of you would do differently knowing what you know now? Who's got to start that one? Uh, we'll start with you, Jim. I'm going to okay. go, I'm going to toggle back and forth. Give um, you a beer. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. I, um, the, the, the early, we, you know, we really only had, uh, two tools, I would say, in the early days of the pandemic. I mean, they were, they each one could be divided up, but one was keeping people apart because it's a communicable disease. So you keep people apart and it doesn't, it doesn't transmit. Um, and then the, the other was once it transmits to so identifying everybody who you've had contact with. And I think at Central, we were late to get into the contact tracing. We one of the one of the challenges in a community like Ellensburg, but this is probably any place where the pandemic uh, b begins to take hold and infections begin to spread, is 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 resources. And we the the county is not equipped to do all of the say contact tracing for all of the central students. Um, so we 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 kind of divided the house. This is the area that you will contact trace in, you know, Dr. Larson. And then we created our own on-campus contact tracing. And I'd say we're we were probably a little bit slow to the game. It would have been it would have been better if we were faster to the game. And then we, we we did it by having our students by creating classes and having our students in uh, in public health uh, learn to be contract tracers, become you know certified in that in that effort. Uh, but but then you know th then they go on spring break, they go on summer hiatus. So we probably more quickly should have created a, a, a professionalized contact tracing at on on for our on campus uh, students that dovetailed with the work that the, the the excellent work that the county has done in contact tracing for the students who live off off campus and for you know the rest of the uh, of the Ellensburg Kittitas Valley uh, community. Yeah, and and I would agree with those the those statements. Um, as I as I try to do a hot wash of of where we've been and where we're going, um, the things that have worked have been when we've communicated well with others. And so, um, as a point two health officer, which is my normal job, I stepped on March sixth. I said I can't. I can't do my regular job at, as a physician and do public health. So I st stepped out and said, I'm just gonna do public health going forward. Um, so I've been a full-time health officer since March 6th of last year. That's been really helpful for our community. It's allowed those things to work, uh, communicating with, um, with the college, with K through 12 schools. All of our K through 12 schools were open through the pandemic and we did not have community spread. We did not have spread within the schools. Those things worked really well. Um, I think if I look back at what we might have done better, I certainly could have done better in dealing with our elected officials. Um, they're, a, they're a tough, um, they are people that I've worked with for a long time. Um, and when we stepped into the pandemic and declared a state of emergency, I became the incident commander, which, um, and was in that position for nine months. That was probably not a good step for me to, to be the incident commander because it, it allowed me to have some control over things that other people could have done better. Uh, but I think if I could have uh, replicated what the work that we've done with Central with the county as a whole and with the businesses in the county as a whole, I think we would have done much better. I, it wasn't until two weeks ago that I, that I went to the um, Republican party in the county and I said, hey, can I come to your meeting? 
And um, I went to the meeting and what they realized um, when I talked to Marlene Pfeiffer the next day, who's the chair of the Republican party, th is that they said, yeah, it was really helpful to have you here because we realized that you didn't have any underlying agenda. So people's expectation and understanding of what's happening uh, is much better when we can do better communication. And, and that I think Central will stand out with that when we when we look at this in in retrospect, not that we can't do be couldn't have done better at Central. I agree with President Godino, the case and contact, the work with athletics, we could, I think we could have done better at Central uh, with a little bit more upfront, um, upfront work as well. Well, I would agree that, that the partnership between the community and the university is excellent. And, you know, we can always go back and say, what would we do differently? Um, but knowing what you knew then when it was happening, what a streamlined um, process. And I, I hear you on the strong communication, what, what a difference that that makes. So now that we're at where, where we are, you know, vaccines are, are much more widely available. Where do we go from here? What are the next steps for the community and what are the next steps for the university? I think that's to you to start Dr. Larson. Yeah, I think if you look at, we, we just had a big holiday as was pointed out, we had Memorial Day. I think I would owe like $4 to the Rotary for those questions <laughs> that I didn't get correct. But, um, but we just had a stress test in Kittitas County and, and in the country as a whole, you know, we're, we're all unmasked, those people that are vaccinated. Um, everyone else has taken their masks off as well. Um, we've had big jumps of cases after every holiday. We currently have 50% of people in Kittitas County that are over, older than 16 uh, having initiated vaccination and probably another 11% of people that have had COVID-19 uh, disease. There's some crossover. Uh, some of those people have gotten vaccinated as well. But let's say we have 60% of people that have some protection. Is that enough? So I think we'll know in the next seven to 10 days whether that's enough. We will, we will definitely have a, a, a bump. And what I'm hoping to see is not very big of a bump, but if we have a big bump, then that 60% is not enough. And and we are currently working closely with, not just with Central, but with employers in town. We The 301, which is a tavern downtown, had an outbreak um, and they've had a vaccination clinic that was very successful. Um, uh, as a community partner, we're gonna do another vaccine clinic there that also affects uh, a lot of the people that, that I, I actually worked at that vaccination clinic, a lot of those folks were central students working in the bar and restaurant business. We are doing a vaccination clinic at the farmer's market on Saturday. So vaccines are really important coming up. And I think as we see, um, as we see what kind of results we got from our stress test on, from COVID this last weekend, I think we're gonna, know how much harder we're going to have to push. That leads into the idea of mandating vaccinations. It, they are, should vaccines be mandated at colleges? Should vaccines be mandated in certain businesses? Um, labor and industry has guidance in regards to what those people that are vaccinated and those people that are not vaccinated can do. And, and I think that's really the next big step as we move forward to, you know, I've talked to President Godino about this since last summer, that our goal is to have Central back fully in the fall, full campus, full student dorms, as many people as wanna come. And it requires a lot of work moving forward and vaccines are a big part of that. Uh, testing is a part of that and obviously contact tracing. And, and what we do with Central and whether we make Central successful or not, has a huge effect on the community as a whole and whether or not our K through 12 schools are gonna be successful in that, whether our downtown businesses are gonna be successful at that. So, so the work that I've done with Central, uh, although I really like Central, um, is also very selfish in my part because the work that I can do at Central really has a huge effect on the community as a whole. I, I completely agree with what Dr. Larson is saying. I think the key to a successful year, in fact, you know, 
somewhat quietly, uh, but I have said it a number of times on campus and small and small gatherings. If we don't if we don't reach whatever that magical threshold for vaccinations are, and my, of course, I am not a a a, a physician or or a, a trained uh, epidemiologist, but if it, it's it's not fifty percent of my students being vaccinated, my faculty and my staff being vaccinated, it's going to be a higher percentage of that. Uh, we're probably not going to get through the 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 full academic year without some sort of a shutdown or containment of activities. Um, uh, so it's 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 absolutely essential that we that we get vaccinated. Now I have, as all six of the public universities in the state of Washington uh, have announced, we will require uh, COVID vaccinations for reentry to campus activities, not to our online activities, uh, or from say uh, 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 we have a few. Uh, People who have who will probably continue uh, working remotely. Their 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 work allows that. Uh, so th those folks will not be, be required to be uh, vaccinated, but everybody else will. The question, of course, becomes: What's the validation of that? Is it attestation? Uh, is it is it you know the CDC vaccination card, what some people call the vaccination passport? And uh, I'm of a belief that it has to be it, it has to be that that physical validation that it, that attestation won't do it. My, my guess is if we were to have an outbreak on campus, and an outbreak is a pretty small number, it's, is it three, Dr. Larson is, is defined as an outbreak, that, that he'll go into, the, into a contact tracing uh, uh, mode and we'll begin to contact trace to see how that outbreak ha is manifest. In, um, and we would probably find it challenging to, to take attestation to eliminate folks from the contact tracing. So they would go into quarantine until the, their test came back. And, and, and of course, contact tracing goes into multiple steps. So I think vaccinations are the key. And of course, that's, a, uh, that, that's, a, that's both a political sized issue. It, there's some debate within the health community about the, you know, the safety of, of, the, of, of the vaccine. Uh, so it's, that's going to be the challenge. We're, we're delayed a little bit at Central from the, making final determinations. Because I have promised my um, my successor, uh, Dr. Jim Wolport, that uh, I would not make a decision that he can't live with. And you know, since he arrives here on the seventh, in fact, I I received a you know a short video from him. He's I think he was in Wyoming. Uh, he's driving out from from Iowa. So he and his wife Sasha are on their way. They'll arrive here, I believe, tomorrow or the or the or, or the next day. Uh, move, start moving in. And be at, at his desk at seven uh, on the on June seventh at at uh, well I don't know what time but I'll say eight o'clock and um, uh, then then the decision making process will begin to solidify and and I will the first person I will introduce them to is, is Dr. Mark Larson so that they make that decision uh, uniformly that's going to be the key that's vaccines are going to be the issue and I I also Aaron just to kind of put a, a you know a, a final point to that. All universities that I'm aware of have immunization policies. So you have to have, for example, the MMR vaccine to come to Central Washington University. You need a meningitis vaccine. So all we're really doing is adding the COVID vaccinations to an existing list of required vaccinations. But this one seems to be much more controversial than, than, the, um, than the existing ones. So, it, we'll see how that how that plays out and what number of students uh, object and whether or not this ends up in the in the Supreme Court. You know, Central Washington University versus Mark Larson. We'll, we don't I don't know how that'll play out, but it, it'll be it'll be fun to watch. Thank you. Uh, so talking about vaccines, I, I'm just curious to know some of the what you're hearing in the community and from a university community perspective. Um, we hear that there's some hesitancy, not, you know, in all communities, there's people who are hesitant to getting the vaccine. But we also know that what's recommended by healthcare professionals is um, that there, there should be a goal to reach seven, 60 to 70 percent vaccination rate. So I'm curious to know um, from a community perspective and university, how, how are you working with individuals that or, or segments of the community that are hesitant and are you building in incentives for people to, to encourage people to be vaccinated? And we'll start with you, Dr. Gardino. Yeah, we are. We, I mean, we, we, well, our faculty and staff 
I really applaud the the opportunity to get to get vaccinated. And while I don't have that percentage, we, we know it. I just don't have it off the top of my head of what percentage. I imagine we mirror the uh, the, the 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 county generally with with a growing number of people who are are uh, willing to get that vaccine. There are I know some people, uh, Aaron, are waiting. Some of our faculty, for example, under the fear that they may they may have the the you know. The, the bad feeling side effects, the the achy, the you know kind of flu like symptoms. Some people are waiting for the end of the of the school year so that they're not they're not feeling that while they're teaching or they're so. And some students, student athletes, for example, want to get through their seasons before they do that for fear of missing a match or missing a game. So I think we'll see a little spike towards the, towards the end. Um, response has been very positive. We we want. Yeah, uh, running eight, eight, nine to one, eight in favor of the vaccine policy. You know, one, uh, one or r roughly ten percent running, um, uh, running anti. You know, you can't make me. It is the general. Uh, it's my body. It's my choice. You can't make me do that. It's unconstitutional uh, for you to do that. We're, the legal opinion is that it's not unconstitutional uh, to uh, to do that. So that's that's what we're seeing. Are we going to incentivize students? Yeah, we 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 started with easy incentives like bringing the vaccine to them. Uh, what what I think uh, Dr. Larson's community calls pop up uh, clinics, where we show up with them to make it easy for them. And and I don't want to announce it yet because again, I'll, it'll be probably announced on the seventh or eighth of June. But we we have some financial incentives uh, targeted towards students who are. Uh, who can show proof of vaccination in the form of scholarship, reduced room rates, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and from a county standpoint, um, or just starting with the legal portion, you know, businesses can require vaccination. If you look at uh, a big hospital system in, in Texas, they have 99% of their staff vaccinated. Um, they are in, in litigation, but uh, I don't think that's gonna hold water. Um, we're trying to reach out to people in lots and lots of ways. So so today the governor is gonna announce some incentives uh, for vaccination. I don't know exactly what those incentives are gonna be. Um, we're working with the Chamber of Commerce um, on uh, vaccination incentive programs. Uh, as I mentioned, the 301, which is the tavern in town, they have their own vaccination. Uh, shot for a shot is what they're doing. Essentially, they're giving a gift card. Um, but but we're reaching out and and reaching out to the to the um, the faith community. We've had really strong relationship with them, just like we have with Central. Um, we're reaching out to farm workers. Um, and for me, if we get five people vaccinated at a, at a visit, that's that's a good result for me. I mean, we're not going to get 600 people at a time anymore because those were the easy the easy pickings. Those are the ones that that really wanted the vaccine. And now we're going to have to work on on, for example, the parents who who want their kids to do sports and to say, you know, if you want to do sports in the fall. If your child is vaccinated, then they are able to do sports without being tested, without having to be put in quarantine, similar to what we're talking with the Central Washington University athletes. So I think it's it's being much more um, personalized. It takes a lot more work on my part. I spent an hour uh, with the English language learner parent group for, for the elementary schools. Uh, with an interpreter, I spoke for uh, to that group, and at the end of an hour, I had one uh, mom who said, "Well, I own a taqueria in town. You've answered all my questions. My husband and I will go get vaccinated tomorrow." So it it takes an hour of a physician's time to get two people vaccinated, and I think that's just the work that we have to do going forward. And and I'm hopeful in regards to that. Thank you, and I see. Jennifer, President Jennifer, sorry to interrupt. I just, I wanted to thank, I saw you standing there and I knew it was time. 
Um, I was hoping to embarrass Dr. Gaudino a little bit, um, and, and, uh, but my hope is, is that Dr. Larson and Dr. Gaudino, we can share your contact information with our group if they have additional questions to email Absolutely. you. And Absolutely. I'd be happy to give you all Jim's cell phone number. You can call him 24 hours a day. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, he's retired yeah. now, so he can take that call. But, but honestly, I just I want to make sure that you know how much we appreciate your leadership, Dr. Gaudino, at the university. And as an alumni, I can't be more proud to be able to say that I graduated from Central Washington University. Um, go Wildcats! Um, and just. Uh, it's been such a pleasure working with you and I know that you'll be around in our community and yeah. our next rotary auction we fully anticipate uh, you and your beautiful wife being there and Dr. Larson um, you will be invited as well thank you so much well, thank you, thank and you. Also, real, real quickly if, if, if you don't want to email me or call me you can usually find me at Koichi Canyon or Crafted after five o'clock well thank you both so very much for taking thank you to be with us today and in honor of you speaking we will be making a gift in your names to uh, yakima rotary charity so oh, thank, thank you so much thank you to wrap up our meeting now with our rotarians are going places day final dave well first of all i'd like to um salute our president this is our last month of being our president of this rotary club and she has, she's had a great year in unusual circumstances. And I would have saluted her as the Rotarian going places, but today we're saluting Central Washington University. So would all of those in the audience that went to Central or graduated from Central, please stand up and remain standing. And those on Zoom, raise your hand and keep your hand up for a second. Please remain standing. President Gaudino, these are the Rotarians going places or have gone places. Thanks in part to their fine education at Central Washington University. Good education does pay off. We wish you, President Gaudino, all the best as you step down in three days as CWU president and hope that you as already an honorary member of the Downtown Rotary Club, will become more involved and participate and become, again, a person going places. And that is my abbreviated Rotarians are going places. So those here in the room can sit down now and those on Zoom can pull your hands down now. So that, and President Jennifer, thank you for your tremendous year. Thank you so very much. Next week's program is going to be Mick Hoffman with the WIAA. And following that on the seven, or excuse me, on the 17th of June, Sonia Rodriguez True is going to recognize our vocational scholarship recipients. Uh, past President Eric Silvers is going to lead those two meetings as Terry and I are going to Costa Rica to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. Uh, but then I'll be back on June 24th, and it's going to be our Rotary year-end celebration. I have a feeling those past presidents are planning quite the party. So until then, we'll see you soon, and we are adjourned. <laughs>